information is based on the needs of autonomy, relatedness, competence, um, which I guess I would say are probably more related to Maslow's higher order needs. And if I keep talking, I'm going to get myself in real trouble on this one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, here's an easy one. How important is it for a student with ADHD to attend a college with a program like UNC's the Learning Center? Wow. What do you think? That's a very good question again. And I'm going to come back to my stock answer of it depends a lot on the individual. I think that it's really important as individuals are looking at what kind of college they think will best meet their needs is to look at who they are what they need, what they want, what they're hoping to get, and to look at what different universities offer and to make the decision based on that. If you're a student with ADHD who has been used to using accommodations, who has, um, has a strong history with working with people to access accommodations, then I would think absolutely it's really important to be at an institution that provides that. If you're, but for some other individuals, there may be other things that are more important. They may have a particular content focus um, that would that require that makes them consider another school to be a better fit. And then the question would be, are there some ways I can get those resources, even if I'm not at a place that is as well endowed with them? And so I just think it's such an individual matter. I mean, my first answer is, yes, of course, you need to go to UNC. <laughs> but I think that it's a much more complicated answer than that, in that I think it's really important that each individual assess where they are, what their needs are, what's provided in the setting. And that's not an easy thing to do, particularly with the way colleges are marketing now. Some of us were talking about that earlier. I don't know that we're always giving students um, the best view into what's really available on campus and how we're all differentiated. Um, instead, I think, I know when my daughter was applying to colleges and we got that boatload of mail every day from different colleges, I thought, I, you know, I thought we could have just interchanged a lot of the um, university names. I mean, first of all, everyone's smiling. It's always a sunny day. And, you know, it can be hard to sort some of that out. And I think that's, again, when we look at self-determination, the importance of accessing resources and support. That's when you need to access your support system. You need to access your resources. Talk with people who have actually been to that school. What was it like? What did they experience? And talk with several so you're not relying on one person. Go visit. Take a look. Ask questions. Okay. Do you see a lot of difference in males and females becoming more self-determined? That's an interesting question as well. Um, in our studies, we have found no difference. There were no significant differences between uh, males and females on our assessments of self-determination. So I guess that's the clearest answer I can provide. Um, how do you think technology either aids or interferes with the development of self-determination? Remember that discussion we had about friends and family? <laughs> <laughs> that friends and family can be the greatest support to self-determination, but also the greatest hindrance? Well, um, I think the same thing with technology. I think that it's an incredibly useful resource and tool that really can help us to be much more self-determined. However, we also find that it can get in the way. We can get lost on the web. I can get lost on the web. Oh, the places I've gone, the Caribbean islands I have seen when I was supposed to be doing something else. Um, so I think a key with technology is learning how to control it how we can be in the driver's seat. So we use it as a tool to help us rather than a tool that gets in our way. Um, I've just recently heard about an app that's called Self, what is it again? Self-control. Self-control. That 
is an app that primarily students use to block certain internet sites that they might like to go to. I know Facebook is supposed to be passe now, but think of like Facebook. <laughs> um, that with younger people, because too many of us older people have started using it. Anyway, that to block those sites that we may tend to wander away when we're doing something else that we want to be doing. So finding those kinds of tools to put us in charge and to put us back in charge, um, I think, can make technology a wonderful tool to help promote self-determination. Thank you. Do you think um, fear can ever be considered a positive motivator? Can be used as a positive motivator? These are good questions. Um, first of all, I think fear is really important. You know, I think that fear exists for a reason, and that's to protect us. And we need to pay attention to our fears. I don't. I, I do not believe in just eradicating fear. I think it plays a very useful um, role, especially in self-determination. If self-determination is about getting what we want and we're thinking about taking a certain action and we feel fearful about that action, I think it's really important for us to consider why do we? Do we need to put in some scaffolding? Do we, do we need to put in something protective for ourselves? And so, uh, in many ways, fear can be our friend as long as we don't let it, here's a statement, fear can be our friend as long as we don't let it overwhelm us. Um, I have a friend who's fond of saying that failure is only a learning experience if it's followed by success. And so one of the things that we need to do is we need to structure our experiences so that if we do um, fail in it or struggle in it, that we have a way to recover. Like when I signed up for my computer science 101 class, thank goodness when I went to the class and realized it wasn't going to work for me, it was still within the drop ad period and it didn't mess up my whole semester. So I think fear can be very important in helping us to guide our actions. And then if we look at fear as a motivator, what the research would say is that carrots and sticks can be very helpful in getting us to engage in certain behaviors. So that if we know that there's a reward we're working toward or a punishment that we're trying to avoid, um, boy, it'll get us to do that behavior at that time that that person is asking us to do, telling us that they're either going to give us the carrot or they're going to punish us. However, if we want to engage in that same behavior later and the carrot or the stick isn't there, we're going to be much less, mo less motivated to do that same behavior. So if we have something that we need to accomplish just this once and we never want to do it again, fear might be useful. However, it doesn't sound like a very happy way to live. <laughs> OK, what resources are available post-secondary for young adults with self-determination challenges? Here's a little parenthetical. A permanent life coach or a focused spouse doesn't count. A permanent life coach or a what doesn't count? Or a focused spouse. Or a focused spouse. <laughs> oh my gosh, so I've got limitations here. Um, boy. You know, I think many of the resources that we have talked about today in terms of developing some strategies for ourselves that we can incorporate on a regular basis. And I think we have to remember that we need those on a regular basis. We can't expect that we're going to go through a self-determination course, and then a year later, five years later, 10 years later, that's all still with us. That's something that we've often done with instructional programs. We say, well, the instructional program isn't any good if a year after you've completed it, 
or five years after you've completed it, it's not still there. Well, you know, we we still just because we go to the dentist one year doesn't mean that the next year we don't still need to go back. Um, so it needs ongoing support. So I would say developing a community of people who are like-minded, who can support each other in self-determination. I think things that we choose to read, habits we choose to develop, can all help. Um, I think once we make something a habit, um, it can be continually self-reinforcing um, so that we can maintain it for a longer period of time. Last question. Okay. How can I support a relative who has an older child with significant challenges like ADHD or Asperger's in helping her to allow her child to make her own decisions and fail and learn from those mistakes? So how to play a supportive role? Okay. Um, my first question would be what your relationship with this individual is because that would make a lot of difference in terms of you're working, if, if the person that you are trying to support who is the parent of this individual is a client, you know, if you're a therapist or if you're, um, or if that person is a friend or, so whatever that relationship is, it, whatever you did would need to be appropriate to that. But I would say the biggest thing would be to listen. Um, one of the things that I think we have learned throughout this exploration of self-determination over the last 25 years is that one of the most powerful things we can do for another individual is to truly listen to and understand them and reflect back what they're telling us and that so often when we're listening we are mentally someplace else if not physically someplace else on the phone but to truly take the time to stop, to give some attention, to listen, to reflect back, most often people will begin to solve some of their own issues. And so if it's truly a, a friendship and there's not another role that you're playing with that individual, um, I would think the most important thing to do would be to listen in a way that you're really trying to understand what they're experiencing and it may be that there's some good reason that they're feeling more fearful about what may or may not happen to their son or daughter and 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 that by having a listening ear they'll be able to work through it. Thank you so much for your participation, for your involvement. Um, as I said earlier, this is all just a real honor to be here. I, you've all built so much and to be included as a part of it today um, has, has been a real privilege. Thank you.